Difficulty is the very core of video games. After all, game design is all about presenting a series of obstacles for the player to overcome. One of the most common ways to do this is the tried and true boss fight. These are often the most challenging parts of games, as well as the most engaging. Ideally, the boss should be difficult, but also fair. Of course, actually accomplishing that is easier said than done. A hard but fair boss should fulfill several of the following criteria. Biggest rule of all, if you die, it's a mistake you made that you can learn from. Two, there should be little to no chance involved. Three, once you figure them out, they should still be hard. Four, if there is a method to cheese the boss, it shouldn't be easy to pull off. With that out of the way, let's get to it. Difficulty has always been an upstanding force in the Metroid franchise. A lot of the navigation and boss fights in these games can easily throw up beginners who are not accustomed to the gameplay loop. And then we get Samus Returns, a game that gives even series veterans a good old taste of butt spanking in the form of Diggernaut. As one of the new bosses introduced in this game, Diggernaut has to be one of the longest, most complex fights the Metroid series had to offer. It's up there with some of Prime's finest, I tell you what. Even before you fight this boss, it's already out for blood and chasing you down multiple corridors. Apparently it didn't attack Samus the first time around, so I guess the sudden burst of hostility is really one of the biggest mistakes she could have made. Or best, depending on if you enjoyed the fight or not. Diggernaut has a huge arsenal of attacks, ranging from hauling its oversized drills at you to firing lasers from its head. Once you're able to do enough damage to it, you can climb into one of its drills using the spider ball to bomb the drills from the inside. And yeah, get used to using the spider ball because it's very important in this fight. In its later phases, Diggernaut will mix up the use of drills to mine for energy debris and start using its lasers in more creative ways. Adding on, it will try to vacuum you up and the only way to damage him in this portion is by clenching with the spider ball and throwing bombs at it. That's how far you gotta go to survive this thing. Finally, once its core is exposed, you clench onto its head to bomb the exposed gaps while avoiding his electric shock attack. Diggernaut is a boss that really makes you use some of the niche mechanics you wouldn't think about using in a boss fight. It really pushes the creativity of what the upgrades in Samus Returns can offer. The use of morph balls and bombs really come together as well since you would get the power bomb as a reward for demolishing the Chozo's greatest weapon, arguably. Symbolically, the challenges in a Pokemon game kinda grow as you do. You start off simply with wild Pokemon or NPCs with sniper vision, then gradually grind your way to gym battles slash your rivals slash the villain teams before finally getting an audience with the Elite Four and then the King of the Hill, the Champion. You grow little by little with every fight and each fight can be easy to overcome with the right training. But Lord knows some of them will put you through the ringer with the freaking cow tanks that no rock type moves get that makes sense. And arguably the best, the creme de la creme, the most popular of the champions is Cynthia, the matriarch of Sinnoh. Off the bat, she has one of the most unique and memorable designs in the franchise. Nicely contrasting color scheme, rocking that heavy black coat, all wrapped up in a calm, collected package, emphasizing how much she lets her skills do the talking. Speaking of, her secret to success is definitely the variety her team has, thanks to not being focused on a single type. Of her Gen 4 lineups, I want to focus on her Platinum team, which is undeniably her strongest. Right when the battle starts, you're staring down her Spear Tomb, which, at the time, had no weaknesses. Its only weakness is fairy types which wouldn't come around till Gen 6. Lucario, Roserade, and Togekiss all have diverse movesets and are crazy strong. Her Milotic is super tanky and hard to kill. And of course, that infamous Garchomp. 
It's almost impossible to outspeed and will kill most Pokemon in one to two hits. Canonically, Cynthia is actually one of the strongest trainers in the world, surpassing most champions with only Red, Leon, and maybe Blue being as strong as, if not stronger, than her. And after fighting her, I believe it. So if you build your team up enough to take her down with even one Pokemon left, you genuinely feel like you earned your championship status in the end. The impact she's had as an opponent practically guaranteed she'd be a recurring face in the franchise. It's basically become a meme. Heck, they won't admit it out loud, but look at Volo from Legends Arceus and tell me they ain't related. They practically use the same team. Also, quick footnote, her Gen 4 remake fights add items and more competitive movesets, making her even harder to beat. And that's about all I want to say about Brilliant Diamond and Shiny Pearl. I'm sorry, but they're so freaking dull! When it comes to difficulty, raid bosses are in a tricky situation. Often, it's quite literally impossible to fight them alone without major exploits. And sometimes, when that's the case, the cheese can be ridiculously easy to pull off. This is especially so in the first two Borderlands games, where most, if not all, of the raid bosses carried the moniker The Invincible to really sell that these guys aren't to be messed with. But in terms of fair difficulty, again, you have the likes of Pyropete and Hyperius being ludicrously easy to cheese solo, or on the other end of the spectrum, there's Master G and Exiguous, two stupidly long and annoying fights that are not worth farming at all. But the black sheep of the franchise, Borderlands the pre-sequel, does something very interesting with one of its super bosses. It makes it the final boss of the DLC. Let's set the scene, shall we? Hidden deep within the mind of everyone's favorite bumbling trash can claptrap is what's known as the H Source, a treasure trove of Hyperion's most secret and powerful designs, something Handsome Jack really wants his hands on. As you adventure inside, you meet Shadow Trap, a totally trustworthy guide representing Claptrap's new vault hunting abilities, to the surprise of absolutely nobody. He turns out to be the villain, wanting revenge on pretty much everyone for how Clappy's been abused and taken advantage of. Taking control of the H source, Shadow Trap heads deep into Claptrap's subconscious to try and break out into the real world and kill everyone who treated him like dirt. And well, of course, you can't just let that happen. But he's not going down without a massive three-stage boss fight. The first phase is fine. Him just sicking an enemy gauntlet on you and using Claptrap's hope and self-esteem as shields that you need to take out. But things ramp up big time when he tricks you into thinking you've won, only to pull a giant fuck off robot, or Eclipse as it's called. This is where things start getting crazy. Eclipse has a huge health bar, meaning you're not going to be doing much damage even if you're laying into his weak spots with powerful corrosive guns. Good luck even doing that when you're being swarmed by lasers, bugs, glitches, and oh yeah, homing missile swarms that he periodically sends out that can down you in an instant. Even with the game providing you with health, ammo restocks, jump pads, and volatile corrosive bombs scattered around the arena, doesn't mitigate the insane heat Shadow Trap is packing. But if you can manage to whittle down his health bar, he's... STILL not done! He re-engages the H-Source into EOS, a massive digital replica of the Helios space station that's been omnipresent in the sky across both Borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel. It's a Death Star! You're basically fighting a Death Star now! And he's even tankier! More turrets, more missiles, more minions, more health, and oh yeah, it's a freaking Death Star! If you get caught in his laser, Shadow Trap is downing you, no questions asked. Shadow Trap's boss fight is an absolute gauntlet that keeps escalating in difficulty and spectacle the more it goes on. The only thing that keeps this fight from getting higher is that there are checkpoints in between phases, and you can tailor your build to hopefully make this go down a bit easier. But man, we know Claptrap of all people had demons like this. It's always the one you least suspect. This might sound uh, unbelievable to some of you, but um, Cuphead bosses are not as hard as they used to be. Some of the game's hardest, such as Calamaria and Dr. Cal Robot, have been patched to have more parry projectiles, and even King Dice has been tweaked to accommodate for Miss Chalice's gameplay. Honestly, a handful of bosses in this game have gotten easier because of Chalice. 
Fortunately, the bosses introduced in Delicious Last Course are made with Chalice's gameplay in mind. This brings us to the big bad of the campaign, Chef Salt Baker. This flask fellow is introduced as a friendly chef who offers to help bring Miss Chalice back to life by baking the Wonder Tart. So you help the chef collect the ingredients and big surprise, not really. He's crazy and wants to kill you so he can turn you into a dish. The Salt Baker fight is legit. One of the most well animated fights this game has to offer from how smoothly he moves to the way he transitions from dicing one ingredient to another. It's eye candy. Not that I want salt on my candy, but hey, he's evil for a reason. Adding more to the Marvel, this is a very busy fight. Salt Baker will throw piece after piece of ingredients at you and they can easily overwhelm you. So you really have to pay attention to which attack he's gonna do next. Of course, this would be much easier done if he didn't have to deal with that annoying jumping fireball. And then there's the second phase, which can't even damage him directly. So you have to peg on launching the pepper shakers back at him. All the while he throws pineapple mint leaves at you, but Let's be real here, that fireball is still the worst thing on the screen. Third phase isn't as hard as the others, but the positioning of his drop can still throw you off if you're not prepared. And in the final phase, you jump from one shard to another as Salt Baker corners you between the terrifying pillars made out of his insides, bouncing his heart around like Pong. He's very tricky to hit here, but Chalice's dash parry can give her some good edge when needed. And yes, he's even harder in the expert version. You have two fireballs to deal with for two phases straight. Oh, and there's one extra dough cutter in the third phase and the pillars in the fourth phase close in on you even faster. And after going out of his way to brutally maim and cook us, what punishment does he get? Community service. Eh, still harsher than what Darklaw gets. I think it's not that big a stretch to say that this is Cuphead's hardest fight yet, as well as one of the best. The way its incredible animations and sturdy difficulty blend together makes for a course that's sure to leave a good taste in our mouths. Seriously though, don't put salt on your cake. One of the common criticisms you'd hear about Mario and Luigi Bowser's inside story is that it's too easy? I mean, a lot of the bosses don't do as much damage as the ones in Superstar Saga and Partners in Time, and these special attacks get overpowered relatively fast. So aside from maybe Junker and Fawful Express, there aren't that many roadblocks that give players more of that eye-opening gut punch. I say that, but then Bowser came through the door and vacuumed up my phone. Within many of the gauntlets of Bowser's Bowels is a boss rush that you can fight through once you've beaten all of the X versions of the previous bosses. At the end of the gauntlet is the new and improved Bowser X. This is our first taste of Mario and Luigi's many super bosses to come and boy what a first impression. Boasting over 7,000 HP, 10,000 of a challenge medal, Bowser comes blazing with a mix of tricky punches, a series of flamethrower attacks, and some of his own specials like the Goomba Storm and the Shy Guy Squad. What's more is that he can turn giant in between some turns and chase you down through the fiery arena. A lot of these attacks get gradually faster the more you counter them and they hit pretty dang hard too. And if you think you can mop through this fight with Falling Star or Magic Window, think again. Bowser X will vacuum up each bro's attack you use against him, disabling them for five turns. Your only option is to use all of your bro's attacks, weak or strong, to do consistent damage to him and no, stalling isn't an option. You only have a few turns to beat him, minus the ones you spent on previous bosses, so you gotta make every turn count. Even with Dream Team and Paper Jam's higher difficulty, their super bosses don't hold a candle to this one. Those games give you a myriad of badges and cards that make you invulnerable or overpowered, but in this game, you don't get that luxury without a cost. The best option you have to make the fight easier is to grind for items from the previous bosses with Mighty Meteor. And even then, you still need the right set of skills to survive and use those items. This fight takes Bowser's name in the game and makes it mean everything. Mario's true nemesis goes through all the highs, posing a massive threat to the bros. Defeating such a titan is an acclaim worthy of Mushroom Kingdom's greatest heroes. If there was ever a Mega Man game that managed to strike the perfect balance of hard but fair, it'd be Zero Three. 
The, uh, I'll be charitable and say, annoying mechanics of the previous entries were either refined or removed entirely, leaving us with pure action platformer mastery. As for the boss fights, well, <laughs> there's no better pick than the final one, Omega. While visually impressive, the first two forms are admittedly pretty underwhelming. That all changes when it's time for the final form, Omega Zero. No one beats Zero. Yeah, as it turns out, Omega is actually Zero. To make a long story short, the Zero we've been playing is actually in a different body hosting the original mind, while Omega has Zero's original body but is a pure evil force of destruction. In other words, Omega is everything that Dr. Wow. Wowi originally created Zero to be. In battle, he's an absolute Beast! He's capable of using your buster and saber along with some of Zero's original techniques. His saber combo straight up ignores invincibility frames, so you're definitely encouraged to stay out of his range. But through the new skills you've learned and the challenges you've overcome thus far, you can defeat your darker self. With so many Mega Man games ending in just another battle against the villain's giant form, it's really refreshing to have a boss you feel more on the level of. Even better, Omega returned in ZX as a secret boss fight where he's even harder. He has even fewer stun gaps and his attacks are much less delayed. Not to mention, his Rakoa attack actually heals him. You need to master the new forms to stand a sliver of a chance. And your reward for conquering the new version? You get to use his powers for yourself. Uh, unless you're on easy mode, in which the game pulls a metaphorical doom finger on you. No, this isn't happening. There's no reason for me to go on. What? What am I fighting for? When you hear Yacht Claw, I bet the first game that comes to mind is Shovel Knight. The second game in mind would be the Shovel Knight spin-offs. Now, with that said, if there is a third game to bring up, it'd be none other than Mina the Hollow. Uh, okay, enough of that. We're talking about Cyber Shadow. Our modern day Ninja Gaiden here, well, current modern day, Magua. really knows how to take the best of the old games and leave behind the fatty parts. For example, the final boss. Ninja Gaiden final bosses have a history of kicking you in the nards really hard and sending you very far back in the stage before you can get your nards kicked in again. Cyber Shadow's more generous than that by giving you an actual stable checkpoint to start back from, all the while giving us a massive light show with what the finale has to offer. The villain, Dr. Progen, is the scientist responsible for all the massive cyborg infestations spreading across Mecha City. All this was a side effect of trying to become a perfect life form so he could have the power to cure his dying daughter, which also happens to be Shadow's master. I, uh, feel like they copied Sonic's homework here. Shadow, I need your help. Everyone's fate depends on you. Maria! But for her sake, you gotta face off against the doctor and put him out of his misery so that she too can rest in peace. Before you get to fight him, Apparator jumps in for one last duel. It's an Easy fight that you can cheese by spamming shurikens in his face while your power-up refills your special gauge. But you definitely shouldn't take damage here since you want to keep your power-up for the next phase. The doctor emerges from hiding, revealing his cyborg self known as the Progenitor. Inside his capsule, Progenitor will fire homing fireballs at you, as well as some skulls that become turrets when it collides with the ground. Attacking his capsule will cause you to bounce off a little, which can be dangerous if you don't pay attention to your surroundings. In his final form, Progenitor unleashes a huge arsenal of attacks. Giant lasers, flames raining from the sky, tendrils that uproot across the platform, and huge spinning blades that stick out and become hazards. They all hit pretty hard. Even attacking him gets tougher as he uplifts himself to avoid taking direct damage from you. If your power-up is gone by this point, you won't have enough rising flames to attack him with. Fortunately, the elementals are here to aid you as they provide you with platforms, barriers, and sword beams to spare. Even with their help, it doesn't make the fight that much easier. Progenitor can still overwhelm you if you're not prepared to fight him bare-bladed. One of the best things about this fight is how much it encourages you to master all of Shadow's techniques to give yourself a good edge. Dash slashing can save you a lot of time against the Apparator, and deflecting Progenitor's attacks can net you a spare SP or two. Small things like that can mean the world when it comes to saving your run against this boss. 
Progenitor excels at being a complex fight that is sure to keep your brain steaming and fingers sweaty, all the while capping off this incredible cyborg ninja experience. That's a nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the f up. On Zimmer walk sans Zimmer. Da -da -da -da. Once you get past the whole horrific mass murder of beloved characters thing, the No Mercy route of Undertale is more tedious than actually challenging. Aside from the new boss fight against Undyne, the real bulk of it is spent endlessly grinding against the generic monsters. If this was intentional, I'd say it's a great case because this made genocide really, really annoying. Of course, it goes out with a massive bang thanks to Sans. Right off the bat, he sets the stage with his absolutely insane opening attack. The game straight up tells you if you can't get through this alone, you might as well quit now. His attacks primarily consist of pseudo platform challenges, a fitting tribute to the brother you killed. You cannot afford even the slightest mistake as even a simple touch will poison you, costing precious progress and healing items. Eventually, the very UI itself will no longer be safe as he'll attempt to attack you while you're entering commands. He can even completely change attacks in the same turn. It's capped off by a final attack that's as painful to survive as it is satisfying to finally get through. You might say this fight shouldn't be here since it's designed to be unfair. And yeah, it seemed that way based on the cheap tactics Sans would use. But the thing is, it is fair. You can read Sans's patterns. You'll always know what attacks come next. It's a massive spike in difficulty, but it's still doable without relying on obscure exploits. Plus, you can heal, which is, you know, generous. Toby Fox definitely had a lot of fun designing this boss, but with all this technical marvel, it nearly makes up for the emotional scarring you had to get through to get here. Nearly. <laughs> for those who haven't played or know much about Hollow Knight, it's only natural you'd think the main character is the Hollow Knight. But once you do reach the finale, you get to actually fight the titular vessel. And the fight turns out to be underwhelming. On purpose. The poor knight was struggling with being possessed by the Radiance to the point where they were constantly fighting themselves. It makes you wonder, how much stronger would the Hollow Knight be if they're not held back by the infection? Well, turns out we get the answer all the way in Godmaster. Once you get through the first three gauntlets, you unlock the Pantheon of the Night. What would have been the toughest of the four gauntlets if not for the third one having Great Prince frickin' Zodemert. Nevertheless, this gauntlet actually features a good boss to cap the whole thing off. Pure Vessel, aka Hollow Knight at their finest. This boss can be summed up as fighting the Hollow Knight and fast forward. No, really. Their attacks are so much faster here, and they can cut through your health bar like butter. Between the quick slashes, jumping, parrying, and teleporting, you don't get a lot of breathing room fighting this guy. They even retain the special attacks from his infected form, like the pillar attack and the knives mirroring the splotches. Oh, 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 and let's not forget some of those new attacks. As a void child, like you, Pure Vessel can fire tendrils from their body that take up half the screen. And again, just like you, they can focus and it generates a minefield. Now, unlike Zoat, Pure Vessel has a real pattern that you can follow and adapt to. He actually feels fair to fight. Plus, it makes perfect sense that they would be the strong since they're the Hollow Nest's greatest hero, fully realized and not some moronic fan fiction brought to life. And here I thought waiting for Silk Song was the worst part of the series. Pure Vessel is a fantastic duel between two knights of the same brood. It pushes the limits on Hollow Knight's vicious difficulty without overdoing it, while still carrying thematic components that give the fight an atmosphere we not only crave, but will also never forget. Sisyphus Prime Ultra Kill. Already getting to him requires perfection of the game's mechanics. When he says you can't escape, he means it. Dracula, Castlevania. He's the final boss in almost every game in the series, and he makes you feel the burn. Clockwork, Sly Cooper. The vengeful owl is really out for your blood. Lest you have a horseshoe, he's gonna break you. Alma, Ninja Gaiden. Just keep moving to avoid getting hit or grabbed and punch any openings you see. Which is a lot harder than it sounds, thanks to the notoriously bad camera. Maria, Bloodborne. 
she has all of your moves and will use them against you. So keep moving, be mindful of her face change AOE, and don't be greedy when attacking. Sephiroth, Kingdom Hearts 2. He's an optional boss, but he ain't no slouch without the right abilities. Karen, Hades, you steal his money, you kick the crap out of each other, and he gives you discounts. What? Nah, gotta war Ragnarok. She's the perfect target for all three of your Spartan rage attacks. Ornstein and Smog, Dark Souls. Getting familiar with each of their attack patterns could mean the difference between victory and a long trek back to the arena. Queen Larsa, Mushihima Sama. Ah, the good old days when we used to bicker between her and Mike Tyson as the hardest boss in gaming. Kinda miss them. If you played Mario Kart DS back in the day, you may recall how insanely difficult beating the staff ghost times were. If you haven't, all you need to know is that some of these things demand perfection. No matter how good you think you are, you will often not get it on your first try, even with snaking. Especially on Choco Island 2. Worst Mario Kart DS course, Shafrillis. <laughs> you know nothing, my young Padawan. Try beating that ghost and then get back to me. But at the very least, you can rest easy knowing these challenges are optional. Unlike our number one entry, the creator. To make a long and really ridiculous story short, Captain Falcon is challenged by the creator of the universe itself in one final battle with his soul on the line. Said creator's machine is just a transparent blue falcon. In other words, you're racing the developer's staff ghost. Leading up to this, you've gone through one of the most frustratingly impossible story modes in any game. Time limits, rubber band AI, and quite possibly the worst track in a racing game. It's all here. But for one single boss, all that artificial difficulty melts away. All you have to do is beat the staff ghost. Since it's a pre-programmed time, there's no rubber band AI to be found. This right here is game difficulty in its purest, fairest form. No cheap tactics, no RNG, no hidden exploits. It's the ultimate test of everything you've learned, and you know it's possible because it's a staff ghost. You literally have proof in front of your face that you can do it. So whether or not you succeed is on you. Make no mistake, you will struggle here. But when you finally pull it off by the skin of your teeth, nothing will compare. And for that, it has more than earned my pick for the hardest, but fairest video game boss of all time. Now, if only I could actually beat it! Next time on The Fiery Joker, now that Josh has finished his ranking of the hardest video game bosses, the only countdown remaining is the annual fails list. Will Activision Blizzard's reign continue uncontested, or will a new challenger break their record? Find out on December. Find out on January 1st. This is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching. <laughs>